up as backup. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our 10 o'clock session. And you guys are in for what I'm told is a real treat. We've got bring a da bringing data to the masses. And this is, uh, this is gonna be with uh, Colleen Skipper of Tableau Software and Mike Vasaya, who's Director of Software and Data and Reporting at University of Washington. Colleen, she's been uh, in sales at Tableau Software for four years, working with organizations in all industries from uh, healthcare to higher ed, high tech to oil and gas. She loves helping people and organizations solve problems with data and watching that light bulb turn on with new discoveries that will drive change. Mike, who you heard from earlier today, uh, he has uh, been Director of Software Data Reporting for the UW Advancement at the University of Washington. And prior to that, he managed the records management team, led projects to develop UW Advancement's first online reporting tool and automated list segmenting systems. So please welcome uh, Colleen and Mike. Thank you. I think there's a clicker. We'll see if I can make this work. Good morning, and uh, thanks for having us. I'm Colleen with Tableau, and I'm really excited to be here. Hope you all enjoyed Elisa's speech right before this. I know I always find her to be inspiring, so it was definitely a treat. And uh, no less than that, Mike's introduction was uh, unbeatable as well. So today this uh, session is called Bringing Data to the Masses, something that uh, both Mike and I are very passionate about. And I have a couple of theories about why you guys are here. So why I'm here is pretty clear. Tableau loves data and I want to inspire you with opportunities for you to use your own data in new and different ways. But why are you here? Why are you at Drive? What, what is it? I'm guessing a couple of things. One is, obviously, data is very important to everyone here. But we're all looking for ways to use it better, make better discoveries, communicate it better. And, and that's what it sounds like a lot of these sessions have been focused on, learning from others. Um, why is data so hard? For a lot of you, and, and even me, sometimes I have just too much data. I have Excel spreadsheets, I have CSV files, these things are being f passed around the office. It's really hard to keep a handle on it, which is the most latest version, which one should I be using, et cetera. I'm guessing some of you may have this problem as well. Maybe another problem would be that your, your data is too inflexible. Um, you're constantly going back and troubleshooting that SQL query that, that you wrote or someone else wrote for you and asking for another one and, and another one to answer those additional questions that come up. Or maybe you're dealing with a BI infrastructure that's just too inflexible to give you the visuals you want. Maybe it's too slow. Maybe it's just, um, it's just not quite cutting it for these questions that you have every day. The, the bottom line is pretty simple, that the process for using data to drive change is fundamentally broken. This is the problem that, that Tableau is trying to solve. Tableau, our mission statement is really simple. It's to help people see and understand data. This is an ambitious uh, mission. The masses, bringing data to the masses, that's a lot of people. And data, as we know, is growing every day, every year. So, but we're really committed to it because we believe that hidden in that data are our keys and insights that can fundamentally transform the world. So how do we do that? How do we help people see and understand their data? The best way to show you that is not with a PowerPoint slide. So much like Elisa did, I'm gonna give a quick demonstration of Tableau and we'll, we'll make some insights and data together here this morning. So with that, let's try and switch over. All right. So thanks for bearing with me. This is Tableau Desktop. You just saw it a minute ago in Elisa's presentation, but I'm gonna to connect to some data that I have available to me on Kiva, a microfinancing organization that makes loans around the world, um, small loans, to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get credit. So I'm gonna to connect to this data source. You can see the list I cl just clicked through. Wherever and however your organization stores your data, Tableau can access that. So here I have Kiva. I know that um, they, They've been around for quite a while, but let's, find, let's say that I'm new at Kiva and I'm charged with maybe like Elisa telling the story of Kiva to bring in new lenders um, and just find a new fresh way to tell that story. So let's ask some questions. 
Now, I'm, I'm at Kiva, and I say, well, let's just find out. How many loans has Kiva made in, the, in our history? Looks like it's just over 600,000. OK, well, how much money is that is the obvious next question. So loan amount, wow. Almost $500 million Kiva has loaned out over the course of its life so far. Now, I know one of their, one of their missions is to particularly give loans out to women who have a, a harder time finding credit elsewhere or, or money capital elsewhere. So let's find out a little bit more. Now, how many, how many women is that? Or how much money have they given to women? It looks like almost at least two-thirds of their money has gone to women. Now, I can slice and dice through this. I can say, OK, that's interesting with women. What's the, the average loan amount been? Let me take women off that and just move back and say, well, that's the total. What's the average loan amount? Oh, it's just been $800. That's their average loan size. That's why they call it microfinancing, I guess. So slicing and dicing through this data and, and going back from average, going back to sum, these aren't things that I had to go back and ask someone to rerun a query for me. I didn't have to go back into a wizard and say, no, I don't want this, I don't want that. In 30 seconds of this presentation, we've actually already answered three or four questions. And we've been working with the visual the whole time to tell the story. So let's move on from here and ask a few next questions that might help me tell the story of Kiva better. So this is who Kiva gives loans to. What about where? That's key next question my husband had when I was showing him this data set last night. He said, well, where? I said, well, good. That's my next point. Um, with a click of a button, I see I have country here. I can ask where. And Tableau gives me the answer just like that with a map. And I can see that they're actually working in, in countries around the world. Adding a little bit more information, like loan amount, tells me that Peru is actually the, company, or the country that has received the most funding from Kiva so far. Whereas others, maybe like neighboring Brazil, it's really been somewhat short. This type of thing where I can ask and answer a question, I can follow my train of thought, I can try and tell a story, is something that Tableau makes really easy. So we can keep asking and moving on. Let's find out where they started. And with a simple slicer that I add here, let's make that available so I can flip through it. Say, well, let's go back to the beginning. Where did, where did Kiva start? It looks like it was Central America and a few countries in Africa. Fast forward several years, and now that's where they ha now have the global reach. This slicing and dicing, the ability to use one visual to answer multiple questions, also reduces analysis time and the whole cycle. So let's keep this going. I promise it's going to be um, pretty short. And then we'll get you over to Mike, who I know you guys are mostly here to see. So this is where. What about what Kiva gives money for? What, what the microfinancing, where are those loans going? What are they funding? I see I have a, a loan sector here. And I, I may not be a, visualiz a visualization expert. In fact, you know that I'm not, because you heard that I've been in sales for four years. <laughs> um, what if I take loan sector, loan amount, and I'm going to have Tableau help me create a great visual that will help me tell this story. So I can see here that one of the things it's suggesting is a bar chart. I can click to that. That's interesting. I can try a few others. And wow, this, this tree map actually tells the story quite nicely around Food, agriculture, and retail, those are the most, uh, the, where most of their money goes towards. And continuing to ask more questions, we could, we could keep going. Maybe we bring out, um, we keep on slicing and dicing. Let's um, build out a tree map that's nice and colorful and, and continue to find some insight. So this is what those loans through Kiva go through to fund. Last question here is over time. Now, I, I find this really interesting. You know, when I first started, maybe we'll start with a uh, number of records. And I wanted to see this from the start and say, um, how has Kiva grown? It looks fairly like a steep, steep growth curve. But what if we are interested in seeing maybe um, loan sector and loan amount instead of number of records? Let's look at it like this. And I'm going to keep using show me. And I, I'd like to see that on a stack bar. This tells me how each of those different loan sectors have changed over time. And I can keep asking maybe complicated math questions that I could never write in Excel because I'm not an Excel expert. 
But I can use Tableau and say, you know, I would really like to know the percent of total. I just want to see how that breaks down as the amount of money has gone, gone up over the years. So even these complicated um, and complex queries, we can make it simple in Tableau and say, I want each of these bars to equal 100%. And now I can see how that's changed over time. This, this agriculture bar, you know, it's, it's stayed somewhat similar, but it's gone up and down. And some of the things pop out at me, like um, food or education, for example, I couldn't find it in, in any of the other bars, but now it's almost 4%. So this is when. This is the when of the story of Kiva. And I think I'm getting to know them quite well now. Uh, so let's pull it all together. So maybe I can make a presentation about Kiva. Maybe I'm going to a conference like this one, and I want to tell people the story and attract new lenders. Um, let's tell the story all at once. Let's pull it all together. Um, so I've got my where. I've got the when. Actually, let me change this so I can see the bottom. Sense. All right. Hopefully that looks OK for you guys. So we've got the where, we've got the when, and let's add the what, and even the who. So making a couple edits, you can make this look however you want it and make sure it's adhering to the style that, that you'd like to present to the world. Um, so a couple quick fixes. But wouldn't it be nice if you could make this interactive so that you could see how they all relate? Well, we can do that with just a, a couple of clicks as well. I don't need to go back to IT or someone who knows how to code these things in. I can, I can have the software help me out with that and complete this project quickly. So I just clicked one button, use this filter, and now I can say, OK, well, Peru, we found you interesting earlier. I can click on that and see how that uh, has changed over time. And actually, they got less money in 2013 uh, than in 2012. I can also see. Um, other different interesting outliers like Mongolia. And wow, these colors, we all just saw that in front of us. These colors look a lot different than the, the sectors that they're funding in Peru. This is now how I could, first of all, find some interesting things out about Kiva, but then go and tell that story more compellingly to, to you know, a boss or a, an a area of constituents, et cetera. So that was my brief demo. Let's go back and see if I can figure out how to make this work. So just a couple more things. Where it all began, Tableau is a Stanford spin-out. Dr. Pat Hammerhan, you'll see on the right there, he, uh, you might recognize him from the Oscars, actually. He was recently there. He's one of the founding members of Pixar that brought us Toy Story and revolutionized computer graphics and animation. His student was Dr. Chris Stolte who was a PhD that uh, student under him. And together, they teamed up with Christian Chabot, our CEO. And in 2003, they formed Tableau. Now, the secret sauce behind all of that, of what I just showed you, and, and how we help people see and feel and, and find their ways to discoveries, is this VizQL patented technology. And basically, all it means is that it takes my dragging and dropping of the mouse, translates it into queries, to send back to a database and presents the results visually. This is a, is a breakthrough, and it's a patent, and it's how, how we empower people to work differently with their data. Why visual? Why is that important? I know you guys uh, care about visualizations, but if you were telling this story, you can steal these slides from me. Um, but here we, you can see uh, company profits by what is category and customer segment. If you're looking at this, let's do a quick quiz. Um, like Ken Jennings, he'd probably win. Um, let's do a quick quiz, a quiz on which segment or which category is the least profitable. All right, how about now? How much easier was that when we just colored it? We didn't change the numbers. It's still numbers. How much easier was that? In fact, there are things that we as humans do precognitively before thinking about it that make us uh, use color, shape, position, size, and movement, and use that to inform where we ask the next question. But now if I were to ask, well, which one is the most profitable? You'd go back to doing that mental math, that eye chart thing. But what about now? The answers are instantly obvious. 
you, you can clearly see that, I believe it's uh, office machines and telephones, they're killing it. Other ones, tables, not so much. This is why visuals are important. Tableau complements your, your human ability to understand data visually. And I would challenge you that it's not just about the end result. It's not just that graph that you stick in the PowerPoint to tell your, to tell your boss what you found. It's how you find that finding, that process of analysis visually. You're going to find a lot more when you're, lo when you're looking at data like this rather than at that number of charts. It's not just the end result. So with that, Tableau in general, we're about making, oh, our products quickly so you understand in concrete terms what we actually make. Um, it's really simple. Tableau desktop, you saw me use that. It's for authors. Maybe they don't know how to code, like me. Um, it's for authors to create beautiful visualizations and analyze their data. Tableau server is where you put, where you can share that to a group of people online. It's server software, you install it behind your firewall and you manage it, IT manages it. Um, and Tableau Online, I actually, you didn't see that portion of it, but that's where I put my Kiva data today. Um, it's, up, it's, a, it's a cloud instance of Tableau Server that uh, it functions the same way, but you don't have to have IT managing the server. In general, Tableau is about making analytics easy for everyone. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Great, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, how many, just really quick, how many of you out there are actually using Tableau at your organization? So quite a few? Okay, yeah. good. Um, we're, at the University of Washington, at least in, in, in my area, in UW Advancement, we're, we are just getting started with this. Uh, so I'm by no means an expert. Uh, I th maybe that qualifies me to be up here because I can talk a little bit about just how, how easy overall it's been. Uh, what I'm going to focus on here is I'm going to talk about our attempt to implement Tableau Server into our existing reporting infrastructure, of which we have a lot. At the University of Washington, we tend to, to build uh, a lot of different things. So one of the challenges for us has been trying to retain the infrastructure we have and that we like, jettison some of the stuff we, we don't like or improve it, and then integrate that, uh, the, the new opportunities that have come up uh, within that. So I'll talk a little bit about our history, how this Tableau opportunity came up for us, some of the initial challenges that we've faced in trying to implement, and then I'll, I'll do a, a kind of a quick show and tell of, of what we actually have. We are in the kind of final stages of beta development of a new reporting suite that will be rolling out to the organization. Um, I see there's a lot of people I work with here, so I don't, I'm hesitant to say how soon we'll be rolling out. Uh, <laughs> it'll be fast, though. So I also want to point out, I have uh, Bart Petrzak here, who works at the University of Washington and is spearheading the Tableau server um, project for the University of Washington. And they've, they've been just awesome. Uh, there's a really kind of, I think, a culture shift going on at the university of, of thinking about these opportunities as big enterprise-wide opportunities. There's a tendency, I think, in universities to be really uh, siloed in your thinking about how you're going to solve problems. So it's great to work with a team that's, that's thinking about the enterprise and, and trying to solve for everybody. So let's get started. I like to just really quickly kind of give you an idea of what, what our organization looks like. Uh, so as you're thinking about some of the things we've done here, you have some context. We have uh, three, three campuses, uh, 16 schools. The important numbers here, I think, to, to note are we have about 400 advancement staff. Maybe 150 of those or so are frontline fundraisers. And we have 22 people in information manglement trying to support those fundraisers. Um, you know, Elisa talked a lot about following a hunch in, in her speech. I think the, the 150 frontline fundraisers, if you ever worked with fundraisers, that represents about six and a half million hunches about their data. Uh, so being able to give them tools that allows them to follow that intuition is, is really important to us. Our database is, I think it's big. We've got about a million entities 
five million gift rows, but you know, on the on the grand scale of things, that is not uh, that's that's not a scary number from a from a data management standpoint. So, I'll talk a little bit about what kind of reporting infrastructure we already have at the University of Washington. So we have a, a lot of published push reports that, that we've designed over the years that we uh, publish online or send out to people. Howard Bihar, who spoke on the first day, he's, he's actually on our board. Uh, he gets very excited when he sees the monthly report of contributions. Um, but this is something we just, you know, we, we actually do in access from our data store and uh, this is a PDF that gets sent out to people, not interactive at all. Uh, in order, this is an eight page report, this is just a couple pages uh, as example, but every school and college gets a, a different version customized for, for them, so. Um, we have custom reporting. So we have four full-time report writers who basically just respond to report requests. They put out about 2,600 custom reports per year uh, based on, you know, can you give me this spreadsheet or this list of people? Uh, and then we have a lot of self-service reporting. Our self-service reporting tool was, I think we first developed that about, uh, it's, over, it's over 10 years old. We've gone through some, some versions of it, but it's a parameter-based query reporting system. Uh, my least favorite thing about it is over the years, we started with about a dozen reports. We now have, uh, this. It actually goes on. I couldn't figure out in PowerPoint how to scroll any further. It was like PowerPoint was saying, no, that's, that's enough. Um, but this is how it's organized. I mean, if you looked closely at this, you'd see pyramid reports all over the place. There's pyramid reports under pyramid report, but then there's pyramid reports under other things. Uh, I always love it when test and other are your biggest categories. Uh, so. <laughs> This is a problem for us. I mean, there's some great reports in here, but it is hyperlink soup here for people to try to figure out uh, you know, where they can get some good information. We tend to have people cling, they find a report that has as much stuff in it, and then they just use that for everything. You know, they import it into, the, into their own spreadsheet and, and, and try, to, to try to work with that. So uh, this is a typical version of one of those reports. You kind of you input some parameters in, into it. I can select a school, date range, gift levels, uh, and you get this. You get, oh, okay, here's a summary of all the donors and how much they gave by level. Each of those little blue numbers actually is a, a hyperlink, so you can get into some detail here about who those donors are. This is, you know, this is great reporting of what you've done so far. It's not especially pretty. Uh, it's not especially extensible, but it, it gets the information that they, that they want to see. Um, recently, we actually went through a project to try to improve the interactivity of that report on our own. And I'm, I'm going to show this because uh, if, I can, if I can get to, I have to remote into my, uh, into my computer here. So bear with me for a second. Um, I'm going to show a report that we developed. Maybe I'm not. What's that? Log in, I guess. Yeah, well, it's not even showing anything here. Hmm? <laughs> I will try that. I'm going to reboot here. Move. OK. All right, here we go. So um, yeah, thanks, now you tell me. OK, so this is a, a prospect pyramid that we, that we developed in .NET. Up here, I can select some parameters of, of a school. Uh, I've got humanities selected right now. I could select social sciences. It shows a pyramid. The resolution is a little smaller than what you would typically see on a computer just because of the projector. But in here are cells of different prospects. I can actually click on any one of these cells and it's gonna re, it's gonna go actually make a call to our database and then return down below uh, a list of, of who those prospects are that you could then download to your desktop. Uh, so it's got a nice little graphic element to it and I can take this and view it in a, oh great, I can view it in a different format Sorry. Um, this is a disaster, isn't it? Uh, 
It's not a demo without one password. I know, not I know. Okay, I gotta get this out. Sorry. This is what people hate about our reports, by the way. Why do I have to <laughs> enter so many things to see it? Uh, and I will be talking about security, so, that, so maybe that's good. Uh, I might just give up here on showing this, but the, the point is that we made a report that was a little bit more interactive, but the, and it was actually faster in, a, in terms of a development cycle than anything we'd done prior to that, but it was still very, very slow to, to develop that. So uh, we started looking at what other opportunities we had for for trying to deploy visualizations um, and interactive reports to our, to our audience. So one of the things that we came up with is uh, Chris's group. Uh, it's called Michelangelo. And did any of you get to see the Michelangelo demo yesterday? Not very many. So I, I kind of want to show it really quick. Um, but now I've got to make this foray back into my stupid remote desktop connection. I don't know if I want to do that. Um, it is a, it's a, it's a great, what? Oh, no, that's okay. It, it's, it's a great application for organizing and managing uh, a list. So we've got a million records in our database. And um, what Michelangelo allows you to do is kind of interact with that list of people. And you know, I really do want to show it. So yeah, I know. It's going to be fast. OK, great. So I'm logging into Michelangelo right now. This is a tool that we developed at the University of Washington. And I'm going to pull up here all of the University of Washington entities that we have. It's just a little over a million. And Michelangelo is going to allow me to uh, if I want to focus on, let's see, I can show none of these people. It's going to take that count on, on down to zero. And then I'm going to grab just the alumni from this list. So um, there I can have alumni. I can select on age criteria, the area that they got their degree. So if I want to focus on, say, just College of Built Environment, you can see this count here goes down. This is a great tool for us. for. Uh, you know, once someone goes through and, and selects their population, they can actually check it out themselves, select the fields they want, uh, and, and save that to their desktop. So this is all to say that this is functionality that we really wanted to be able to retain uh, and, and overlay visualizations on, on top of that infrastructure. So we started evaluating what kind of tools we could use. And we loved Tableau. Uh, but the fact is, it was, it was cost prohibitive for us. Uh, I would say, as a desktop solution, it's great. It's, t it's totally worth it. Um, but to deploy Tableau server for UW Advancement was going to be very expensive and, and pretty difficult to justify. Um, so then we started looking at the Microsoft BI stack. And I, you know, is anybody using some Power Pivot? Power View in Office 2013. I, I actually strongly recommend those tools. They're, they're very good, um, especially as a desktop solution. Uh, but for us, the, the problem with that was to deploy it to the enterprise was going to require SharePoint. Uh, and we had kind of deliberately moved away from, from SharePoint. So I was getting ready to, to open myself up to the idea that we would do that when dun, 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 UWIT, it turns out, actually went out and bought uh, an enterprise-wide license for Tableau Server and started implementing for uh, their enterprise data warehouse has uh, a lot of data that they wanted to expose. So they developed something called UW Profiles and started using Tableau to they have some beautiful reports. So I'll just show a couple quick ones. These are uh, trends in, in where students from the University of, Wa uh, University of Washington students are coming from, um, graduation rates. Uh, this is one on, on graduation by year. So they put together a, just a tremendous number of great dashboards that are available to, to users within the University of Washington and even outside of. So, um, 
So I kind of, I worked with BART to try to position us as a great guinea pig for them for going out to a, another University of Washington unit uh, and trying to see how we could integrate into Tableau Server. So we turn out to be a pretty good example for them. We're a large unit. We deal with data all across the university. We have a lot of users. We have a pretty good history of, of understanding our data. We have some nice uh, extracts and existing reporting. So we had a lot of, we had a suite of reports that we could do some conversion to. So uh, we're, we're fortunate that we, we get to be a pretty good example for them. I always, every time I go to Bart about, hey, can we try this? I'm always thinking, of course he's gonna say, no, that's a crazy harebrained idea. And they're always like, yeah, let's try it. Let's see if that works. So, uh, so it's been a great experience from, from that standpoint. Some of the challenges we faced as we've gone through this project is, like I said, trying to retain all of that core infrastructure. We have, we're getting to the point where we have reporting solutions kind of scattered all over the place and, and people don't really know, like what am I supposed to use for this or that? So, um, so we wanted to keep a lot of that but then also bring more order to those IT offerings. So the thought of adding Tableau Server and saying, hey, if you want visualizations, here's another thing that you, that you need to log into sort of separately and, and try to you know, organize like when you use that was a big challenge that I wanted to make sure that we were able to overcome. Another challenge for us was managing the data. The, the extracts that, that, um, that UWIT had built, the visualizations they did, are generally, I think those are updated on a part of those quarterly, month, yeah, quarterly reports. So uh, they may be dealing with a lot of information, but they're not having to refresh that on, on a high tempo. We, on the other hand, uh, at least among our users, have a, an expectation that you know, they're going to have refreshed data every day. Um, and, and the reports are going to reflect changes from that day or the day before. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of reports. Our report of contributions is monthly. Uh, there are some things that are weekly, but, but we still know that, that there's this big expectation to be able to access data every, t every, every day. Um, another issue we have is access to information. So because this is an enterprise-wide uh, deployment for Tableau Server, they're really trying to, to, be as, uh, to be able to support all of these accounts. And so they have a pretty a pretty simple array of user permissions. There's, there are readers, there are writers, and there are publishers. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mesh well with, with our data because we have some sensitive information that we don't necessarily want to share with everybody. And we have uh, kind of groups, a group permission structure that allows certain people to access certain kinds of information. Uh, and th that was something that we weren't sure we, we know or knew. I, I'm still not certain we know for sure the best way to translate that into Tableau Server. Um, so I kind of went out of order there, but those are kind of the issues. And then the, the, uh, the other issue we had was trying to tackle single sign-on. So with, um, with these applications, I knew if, if we could embed Tableau into our own reporting applications, that'd be great, but uh, users hate to have to log in again uh, you saw me just a second ago railing against that. Uh, so with Tableau 8.1, they're now supporting SAML authentication, which uh, we use at the University of Washington. So now we can, it's actually possible for us to people have people log into the reporting application and then kind of float seamlessly between all of the applications. So I'm going to show you now uh, the, what we've come up with as, as our reporting solution. Uh, I hope this works. Okay, great. So this is the, the new version of our reporting dashboard. And up here, we have Michelangelo is actually going to be added here. But we have uh, this news feed tool we're developing. I really love this. It's kind of off topic, but it's, uh, it's going to be a, a live, dynamic, um, sort of like Facebook for your CRM. It, over on the left, people are going to be the fundraisers or people who use this can kind of define populations of, of people that they're interested in and types of news they want to see. Right now, these are just data packets, but they're going to be constructed more like, 
little stories and updates so that people can see when someone has moved or registered for an event or someone they care about as a, you know, as a fundraising prospect has gotten a new job. Uh, so that's going to be a nice little dashboard for us there. Um, over here on the reporting side, what we've done is we've replaced that screen that lists out all the reports with, with kind of a simpler tagged interface so that we've categorized all the reports. They can be multifaceted, and it's a lot easier to find what you're looking for. Uh, we still, I think up here you can see we have different categories and tags for reports. I'm just going to click on my favorites, and it will show uh, a set of reports. And let's see here. I've, I've got the, this is one that we've just deployed out to the, to the server yesterday. So you can see what we've done here is I have our reporting application that we built. All of our access rights and permissions for our different users are embedded into that reporting application. If I want to show them certain reports, they get to see them. If, if we don't want them to see those, then we can restrict them from seeing those reports. Um, they may still have access because of this permissions issue we're working through. They may still have access if they go directly into Tableau server, um, but that's, that's something we're, we're attempting to work out and, and we have a, a, a lot of different ways to approach it. But, but this is a report that literally we just threw together really quickly with regional data from, from our, our, prospect, our prospecting data. So what I love about this is if I, you know, if I select New England here, it's going to repaint this map here. And what I have is a kind of a temperature scale of where we have prospects and how much money or, or, or how much we think those, what the capacity for those prospects is. I have on the right side some filters by the, the rating code. And then um, this is a list of all the cities. So I could even select one of these cities. And our director of research is sitting here. so. I'm kind of loath to show you. I could actually show you the underlying. Actually, no, I'm gonna, I, can, I can do this. So I can, I've selected a cell here, and I can actually look and see uh, who those records are. I think this is a great, uh, this is a, a great component of Tableau, is it allows you to kind of navigate into an, uh, a cell or an area of interest and then see the, the underlying data that supports that. So all of this is essentially built by taking our production CRM data, which is an Oracle database. We replicate uh, some of that production data and some abstractions of that data to SQL Server. Uh, we, uh, we just, for a lot of reasons, like using SQL Server more than the Oracle production environment. It's kind of nice to have both options. And then that data is pulled up into Tableau uh, at a tempo that, that you can define. So you can say, this report needs to refresh weekly or monthly or daily, um, and, and when you need that refresh to happen. The compression on the, on the data is, is amazing. I think we, we loaded a, f uh, I wish Nick was here, a five megabyte gift table. I think it compressed it down to, to like, I want to say probably 500 kilo, yeah, like half a meg. Um, it's super fast. So the the well, at least super fast for for what we're used to. Um, so the challenges that we that we have going forward, if I'm going to get back to the slide deck here, are are really a more are going to be more not about implementing the product, but organizing it and and kind of reining it in. I know that every, every number we put, anybody who does reporting, you know, every number you put out there is one that you have to be able to explain or be able to replicate. And so it's, while it's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to be able to expose this information to people, you, I think you really have to have a plan about what's your data store going to look like, how are you going to support this, and what kind of parameter, I, I hate to put parameters around the users because our users know the information much better than we do. If we can get it in their hands, uh, you know, there's this, this inference that takes place or this understanding that, you know, when we did screening data, 
uh, and we'd find outliers, uh, we'd look at it and be like, I don't know why that is. Uh, and a, a fundraiser might say, oh, that's, you know what, that's because we, you know, we weren't capturing that data point for, for that three year period. Or we, you know, we, we did this load from of bar association members in Virginia, and, you know, and that's why they know where those outliers come from. So being able to put the information in their hands is a huge benefit, um, but I really don't want this to turn into a wild west like, hey, I got this report from so-and-so, and it doesn't match this other report, and can you tell me you know, why that is? So, so our challenge is to really be pretty methodical about organizing the information that we're putting into this. But the benefits are clear for us. The flexibility is amazing. We can throw slicers and, and uh, filters into reports. So a report that maybe was designed by you know, our school of medicine can now be used um, by, by all kinds of other units. Engineering might say, hey, you know, I love that report that medicine did. Instead of us having to kind of spawn it, rebuild it, and replicate it in some, you know, with some developers, we can, that's just a filter that any school can use. So, um, and it's easy to customize the reports. You don't like the map on the, on the prospect report, then you know, we, can, we can take that off and, and replace it with something else. The simplicity of developing these reports is amazing. I know this to be true because I'm, I'm terrible at it. Um, and I sat down to start trying to, to build reports and dashboards and it was just it was blowing my tiny mind. Uh, how easy it was uh, and how intuitive it was. So I know when we get into this, we are, we are, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a curve to get really good at it, but we are going to be able to go with, with our users and, and sit down and, and really just kind of talking through it with them, you know, slap some things together and then refine it and, and it's gonna work really well. So I'm very excited about that. And it, it's very easy to iterate through changes and fixes. Um, the, I mentioned the performance being, being very good, and I'm, I'm very optimistic that with, with a well-managed data store, with some standards around the reports, uh, being able to have those integrated with our legacy reports, that we're going to be able to achieve a little bit more consistency about the, the numbers that we're reporting to people. And, you know, this is, I think, this is probably the most important thing. Uh, not just for us, but for, for Bart and his team, is to just foster a more data-driven culture at the University of Washington. Uh, you know, don't just take a hunch and then act on it. You know, take a hunch and, and, and look around and look at the data and, and, and see if it's true or see if something else is true. I think a lot of times you're looking for the right answer, um, but sometimes you're really just looking for the right question. You don't even know where to start, and I think this is really going to help us do that. So for us, uh, we're, you know, right now we're on the path to converting our legacy reports. We are trying to harness some of those. I showed you how you could see the underlying data. So we want people to be able to kind of seamlessly take those, those spreadsheet grids of, of the people that they're looking at in those reports and actually check out with it and hand that off for, you know, for mailing services or for some other report. Um, we want to be able to share some of, you know, we have a pretty good data store for the enterprise. Uh, the Advancement is one of the only organizations at the University of Washington that's really following people from start to finish. You know, we care when you're a student, a prospective student, uh, a parent, or while you're a student, once you graduate, uh, on, you know, until the end, <laughs> to be frank about it. Um, and most of the other units, you know, the, they're focused on kind of, you know, the, the payroll system is focused just on employees while they're here. The, the registrar is focused on students while they're here. So we have this great set of data that, that kind of follows people through the whole life cycle. And we want to be able to share that with, with the rest of the university. So um, we're going to be able, I think, to, to, as we start rolling these out, to crowdsource some of these visualizations so the ideas and the development don't have to come out of information management. Like anybody with, uh, with a, a desktop could, could help provide some solutions. And one of the things I'm really excited about that Chris and I have been working on is integrating with that Michelangelo selection tool so that in these visualizations and dashboards that we have, that you can call your own custom list that you've defined in Michelangelo that has all kinds of, you know, maybe you have, I need 
people between the ages of 40 and 45 who live in the DC metro area that graduated from the information school, uh, you know, whatever that might be, take that as a filter that you developed in Michelangelo and actually apply it in a dashboard and see sort of how those lay out. So that's what we're working on. It's been kind of an, an interesting challenge of kind of throwing ideas out and seeing if they work. Uh, most of my brilliant ideas haven't worked, but fortunately, I've got, we've just got a great team. We've got a, a great business analyst, great uh, reporting people, uh, information architect. So um, that's it. That's what we're doing. I wanted, I'm hoping, I, yeah, I wanted to land on a few minutes for questions, if you, if you have any. So for me, for Colleen, or even for Bart, talking about, he knows much more about the, the Tableau server project at the enterprise level. So, yeah? Oh, here, let's take this one here, and then, and then you're next. So, I wonder, can you talk a little bit more about the Tableau versus Microsoft CI stack? Because I found that, like, Microsoft CI stack was more like a service that you acknowledged the value of Microsoft CI stack. Yes. Did you not want to use a service that? That would be a safe characterization, yes. Um, yeah, the, the question was, uh, she, she, she wanted me to, to, to talk a little bit about the decision to use SharePoint over the Microsoft BI stack, and uh, said that it, it seemed in my, in my discussion I acknowledged the, the value of the Microsoft products. And th that's exactly right. Um, they are, I think they're great. If you haven't looked at PowerView or PowerPivot in Excel, they really have done some, some amazing stuff there. The, what I was concerned about uh, in making our decision was I knew that we had to be able to develop these things and then deploy them to the enterprise. We don't have a lot of people who are going to get in there and, and you know, kind of charge through, through these dashboards and spreadsheet solutions. They want things just delivered to them. So for us, it, it was largely about not wanting to go the SharePoint road because we have all of this infrastructure already in place. And, and it, so it wouldn't be just deploying that as a solution. It would really be about trying to convert a lot of other things. Not that it was insurmountable, um, but, but that was a, definitely a major con consideration. The, I think there's a little bit of a performance difference between the two right now, but, um, but it's, it's not great. And truthfully, when Tableau kind of, when it came to us as, hey, it's free for you now. That just made the decision uh, that much easier. So uh, if you look at the Gartner uh, report, actually, Microsoft is, is right up there. Uh, so, so what they're doing with that, sorry, but what they're doing <laughs> with that. We're friends. <laughs> with that stack is, is um, it's, it's pretty good, pretty good stuff. We had a question over here. Yeah. Is that for me? Yeah, yeah, why don't you feel this one? Sure, since I'm so technical. Uh, so the question was about predictive analytics. And a couple of things on that. There are some things, and I almost showed it, but there are some predictive analytics built into the software where you can say, show forecast. And if you have a couple of years of data, it'll, it'll project that out for you, even with some confidence intervals. Um, but it's, and it's super cool. The confidence, uh, sorry to jump in. Uh, I've looked at it a little bit, but it, when it projects it out, you can, you can put like a sort of frame around the projections with their confidence in intervals. Um, so for forecasting, you know, the, those visuals look great. Um, but I would say that it's something where we're continuing to develop in. It hasn't histor historically been something that Tableau has had as a capability. We do also have a new integration with R so that you can write our queries and it'll pass it back it to the R server right and now. present those okay. results visually in Tableau. Um, that's another way that I think some people are handling that. I'll t uh, time for one question and then we need to break. Yeah, go ahead. Is it easier to take your raw data, port it over to Tableau, or is it easier to create, do your calculations in Excel and then port those over to Tableau and then do your visualization? I'm a total newbie, just started working with it last week and I I, you, yes, I do, and I would say as, as, a, as a practice, getting your data cleaned and prepped uh, prior to 
to setting it up is, is important. But, but the tools for, for cleaning it up in 8.1, and I think coming up in, in the next version, are, yeah, are, are very good. So, uh, and having all of the data up and available in, in that cube is generally going to be better for you anyway. OK, I'm sorry. We've got to wrap up here. I'll be around if you want to ask questions. But I've been asked to tell you that there is a break now sponsored by iModules. What's going on at this break, John? <laughs> okay, I will not be around to answer questions, <laughs> but I will be hovering around the donut. So um, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks.